I'd like to welcome you all to the, um, uh, to the Oxford Summer Academy course B um, debate night. Um, this is the culmination of um, uh, a lot of hours of work over the last two weeks from the debate of public speaking elective. Um, uh, and um, I know that their, the teacher, um, uh, their teacher, um, Nadim, has put a lot of time and effort into getting these guys ready um, for the debate that you're going to hear tonight. Um, there will be speeches, there will be um, chances for cross rebuttals, um, and then there will be some chances for um, uh, you guys, the audience, to, to put some questions. Just a little bit on mechanics, actually. Um, main speeches will be from here, but to save people getting up and down and crossing the camera, um, uh, when you do the, your rebuttals, you can stand from where you, where you are, stand from where you are, ask questions in batches of two or three, and then respond in batches of two or three. But we'll, we'll manage that as we go. And the same for the answers to the questions from, from the floor. It just got a bit messy last time. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and we'll do that. Okay, I'll hand you over to the Dean. Um, big round of applause for the Dean. And I'll get all these things. Oh, fine. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Frank, for that very lovely introduction. Uh, I hope uh, this is going to be another night of fascinating topical debate and discussion. Um, the last one, I think, for some of you here may feel a bit like deja vu because you've already been here uh, before, yes, yeah? some of the, uh, the students from the, the previous fortnight. Um, the format for this evening will be that we will have a, uh, a, a vote at the end, uh, very similar to the Oxford Union Thursday debate. Um, we will ask members of the audience to vote in favour of the team uh, which they believe has persuaded them. Remember, public speaking and debate is always about persuasiveness. So I'm aware that the debate for tonight is most likely uh, uh, going to raise people's uh, feelings, I suppose, and, and they will have perhaps already a formulated an opinion on the matter. Uh, political opinions, of course, everybody's allowed to have their own political opinion. But in a debate, uh, what we're trying to test here is your ability to pick out individual arguments which you think are enough to persuade you. So they could be of a rational nature, they may even be of a, an emotional nature, but you, ultimately you are the people who will decide on which side you think have persuaded you. So in a sense, it's not about simply expressing your already held political opinion, but it's more about you deciding which, on balance, between these two teams, um, have come up with the best arguments. And you may find, by the end of tonight, that your own opinion has changed on the matter. Okay, so it's not about fixed opinions, it's more about thinking carefully through some of the arguments. Now, both teams have worked extremely hard. This is, I believe, one of the most poignant topics of the day, of the hour. Uh, the refugee crisis is maybe perhaps linked to other political crises that we're seeing currently in the world. So it is a very topical issue right now. It requires a lot of skill, a lot of rhetorical skill, because public speaking and debating requires you being uh, able to pick out individual words, buzzwords, terminology, but ultimately it also uh, requires a bit of political, I suppose, judgment. Okay, so each individual speaker has decided in their own way to come up with a range of arguments uh, which they believe are enough to convince the audience tonight. So, okay, so that will be the, 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 uh, the introductory session. There will be four speakers in proposition, four in opposition. We will alter, they will alternate. Four minutes is the maximum, as um, Frank said. And then there will be a, that will mark the end of the first session. Then we may give a couple of minutes for the teams to get together um, and to sort of recover from that early session. And then we will start the rebuttals. Now the rebuttals involve individual members choosing to direct questions, individual questions to the opposite team, right? So there's gonna be targeted questioning of the opposite team. Okay, so that will be the rebuttal session. That will be followed by a 20-minute period, so that will mark the end of the second period. That will then be followed by a 20-minute session of questions from the audience. That's you who have attended tonight. So I hope you have, at the back of your mind, uh, good questions, obviously, once you see the, uh, uh, the actual topic for tonight, that you will formulate or start beginning to formulate questions in your head. Again, okay, you can write down, obviously, 
if you have a pen and paper uh, at hand, start writing down what you think would be good questions. Okay, uh, and at the end of that, there will be a floor vote. Oh, yeah. oh, okay, and there will also be a prize for the single best speaker, which I and Frank will together negotiate and perhaps decide on, okay? So that's the format uh, for today. We will ask the audience to leave, uh, sorry, we'll ask the teams to leave when we have the vote at the end. And okay? at, that, at that point, I'll give you guys formal feedback whilst they're making their decision. So there may be a bit of five minutes or so of hanging around. Sorry about okay. that. These guys want their, will, will want their feedback and, and I'll give it to them in private and then, then we can have the result. Right, okay. So this is the motion for tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, this house believes that all refugees should be granted asylum. Okay, so that will be the uh, topic for tonight. Um, so without any further delay, could I please ask the first speaker from the proposition, Samantha? Sorry, sorry, no, sorry, Lega. Okay, Lega, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This House believes that all refugees should be granted asylum. One month ago today was World Refugee Day, yet some nations refuse to acknowledge their existence. Refugees are fleeing all corners of the globe to areas they think they will be accepted and granted protection from the state, also known as asylum. It is no coincidence that this statement can be applied to any time in human history. The founder of Christianity, Christianity himself and a champion of morality, Jesus Christ, was a refugee, according to the Gospel of Matthew. Some Christians do not want to accept refugees because they view them as a danger to their culture, yet they forget that their Lord and Savior was one. The 20th century witnessed the largest waves of refugees from ethnic cleansing and genocide, including the Jewish people, throughout Europe. Many countries in Europe, including the United Kingdom, closed their borders to the Holocaust refugees because they were of a different religion to the majority. Today, many countries throughout the world do not want to accept refugees because they follow a different religion or classified as a different race. Ladies and gentlemen, race is a social construct. It is an unnecessary and artificial division. The religious and racial differences between refugees and the civilians of a nation are superficial. But first, ladies and gentlemen, we must first discern the distinction between a refugee and an immigrant. Defined by the 1951 UN Convention relating to the status of refugees, a refugee is someone who is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or a political opinion. Refugees cannot be those who committed war crimes, crimes against humanity, and serious non-political crimes, such as rape and murder. Based on the convention, no state can expel or return a refugee against his or her will. Asylum protects refugees from their home country's persecuting party and ensures they cannot be returned home. 200,000 refugees were returned in the past year, mostly to Afghanistan and Somalia. Let me remind you, in Afghanistan, the Taliban control more territory than ever before since 2001. In Somalia, there's been a civil war since the 80s, with a government run by terrorists. Imagine having to return to your former home in fear of death or even worse, torture. Take the story of Mohammed Shohab, a man who was forced back to Afghanistan after his request for asylum in Germany was denied, even though he lived there for the past six years and worked as a major newspaper columnist. He returned home to a village taken over by, as a Taliban stronghold with his family. No word has been heard from him since, Janu um, since January, and he is presumed dead, along with his family. These 200,000 returned refugees should not be seen as numbers, but as individuals, such as Muhammad and his family. Don't all human beings have the right to safety, the right to asylum, the right to justice? As Sir Michael Dummett, a distinguished scholar on refugees and logic from this very university once said, it cannot be admitted that any state has a right to refuse asylum to intending refugees because of their race, religion, or background, any more than an employer has a right to refuse applicants for jobs for any of those reasons. We cannot make the same mistakes as government had in the past centuries and value one group as more worthy of asylum than another and value one more human life as more than another. Seeking asylum is not a crime. It is a human right recognized by the UN in 1951. People have sought refuge for millennia, from Jesus Christ to the refugees of the Holocaust to the Syrians fleeing the Saad regime in 2018. Humans have always been on the move, in flight from war, atrocity, tyranny, and persecution. It is an integral part of human history and progress. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, it would be inhumane to not grant asylum to all refugees. Thank you. Uh, I don't know 
on it really. Okay, so you've got the rebuttal sessions, yeah? Um, so can we have the first speaker for the opposition wang, please? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I would like to present to you the opposing side to this case. This House disagrees to the proposition of always accepting refugees um, and of providing asylum to them in every case. Um, please, allow me to start by saying that our side does not disagree with accepting refugees themselves. Rather, we seek a better solution to the refugee crisis rather than just blindly accepting refugees. Refugee crises are a major issue in today's society. According to the official Mercy Corps website, as of July 5th, 2018, about 68 million people are displaced from their homes. To put that into perspective, imagine every person living in the UK currently fleeing their country in search of asylum. The countries responsible for this issue are mostly war-torn countries located in the Middle East and Africa, and Syria alone is already accountable for approximately 10% of all current refugees. Afghanistan was once home to 2.6 million refugees, and South Sudan, one of the youngest countries in the world, is already responsible for 2.4 million refugees. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, these numbers are no joke, and this is a massive issue not to be taken lightly at all. Places such as the European Union and the United States are woefully underprepared to deal with this issue, and due to that, this problem will not simply resolve itself like most other significant problems, sadly, there are no quick and easy short-term solutions to deal with this issue as well. And to properly solve this issue, um, we must look to another method. In order to find a better solution to the refugee crisis than the, pro than the proposition suggests, I propose an alternative method to this controversial issue, despite the idea that always granting asylum to all refugees is the morally correct argument. Our side agrees with the proposition um, side to only some extent, as we agree to accept the majority of refugees that seek asylum, as long as the act of accepting these refugees is in the power of the countries accepting them. But we believe that this should only be performed up till the countries accepting them have utilized all their financial resources, and from that point onwards, countries should, instead of accepting more refugees and trying to help as many people as possible, which is the morally right argument, they should use more time and resources to help accelerate their economy and focus on growth inside the country with the refugees that they have taken in. Thus, in the near future, the countries will have more resources to help accelerate their economy um, and to take in a larger amount, or if not all the refugees who come to our shores to seek asylum, which would end up being a better solution for the entire problem in general. In conclusion, our side believes that a proposal and method is the best course of action to take in this current situation as the solution to the, the proposition suggests has been attempted without major success. In the wise words of philosopher George Santanyana, those who do not learn history are doomed to repeat it. Dear members of the audience, I implore you to try and see how there are better methods of resolving this issue than just blindly welcoming all refugees without regard to the government or the economy. Thank you very much. Okay, we have Emma for the second speaker for the position. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir, members of the House. When families live in cities that are bombed every day, when families live in makeshift slums to survive, and we see children drowning trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea to a safer world, we believe change must be made. Our motion makes that change. Accepting all refugees is the only choice that could be considered moral in this way. But more than that, we are explicitly telling you the benefits that we will see following the passing of this motion. And today I'm going to bring you the cultural benefits. First of all, about multiculturalism. Secondly, um, about education. And thirdly, a point about the morality um, uh, uh, in this debate. But first of all, I'd like to um, discuss the uh, alternative proposal we heard from the first speaker of the opposition. Um, so the idea was to fix the roots of the issue um, in, in the war torn countries. Firstly, we say that that's actually more difficult than they say. It's difficult to go to a country and try and sort out all their issues. And I would say that previous attempts to do so have caused more issues and caused more war and more um, problems in these countries. So I think that's going to cause actually more harm than good and cause more refugee issues. Secondly, I tell them, why not both? Why not try to trade with them and build up their economy and take in refugees well, whilst there is nowhere for them to live? We think we can, like, if, they, if that's something they want to do, we can um, arguably do both. But I think military intervention is going to cause more harm than good in this debate. 
So that's, what my, that's one of my substantive and my first point about multiculturalism. When refugees come across to countries um, such as the UK, United States, they bring with them their traditions, their lifestyles, their entertainments, their foods, and they teach us about their way of life. We think that's ultimately good. We think that it benefits us um, and other countries that, um, where refugees go. Um, let's talk about the impact of this. First, firstly, um, these countries have broader choices. They have more quantity of things they want to do. For example, um, refugees bring with them foods, different celebrations. We think that all of that just adds more colour to our cultures. Um, secondly, we have a more enriched culture. We think that integrating different refugees' cultures and ideas into um, our own cultures is something that makes them um, nicer, it makes them more inclusive. And thirdly, we think it makes people um, living in countries like the USA, France, Germany, more empathetic, more understanding, more exposed to different cultures, more different, uh, different ways of life, different religions, etc. I think that's really important. Um, I'm going to go on to talk about why that is in my second point, which is about education. So this education idea comes in two forms. Firstly, like with young people. So when we have refugees coming into local countries, we get better diversity in classrooms. And we think that's really important because young people then grow up with people who, are, um, who have different experiences in life, who have um, escaped uh, horrible situations. And that's um, a really important learning opportunity for people, uh, for refugees and for um, children in more privileged situations. And secondly, we have diversity within communities. When you have people uh, living in your housing estate that have experienced um, all the trauma that we see on the news, we think that makes them more real, we think that makes them more humanised, and we think that's really important. We think that's particularly important because of things like Brexit, because of the rise of Islamophobia, because of people like Trump. We think that these people are creating a really hostile environment for um, people, um, like um, uh, people of different faiths, people of different religions, and um, people uh, from different areas of the world. But we think that um, more exposure to these cultures, more exposure to these people, it's just something that will make us more tolerant as a uh, society. Um, so we think that has a lot of really important impacts. I'd just like to deal with uh, um, this idea of national identity that might come up from side opposition. We think that the growth of nationalism we're seeing in places like England under the status quo is incredibly harmful. And instead we should be focusing on an idea of a global identity, the fact that we can all have different cultures, different ideas, different religions, we can live along to beside each other um, harmoniously. And we think that's a really important idea, something that we're really supporting um, under side opposition. Um, and I'd like to quickly touch on this idea about morality. The countries that we're talking about, the countries that are going to be taking refugees in, such as the USA, such as the UK and France, um, they have a moral duty to take refugees in. Why is that? Firstly, because they have strong economies, because they have fair, uh, fairly um, stable um, political systems, because they have the capability of the space to take refugees in. We think they have a duty. Um, secondly, um, in a lot of cases, these countries are responsible for the instability. For example, in the Middle East, um, in countries like Iraq, the USA and the UK could be um, to blame for a lot of the, the refugees that we have, as you think that um, they have a direct responsibility for those, and thirdly, because they're human beings. We think that refugees deserve the right to life, the right to safety, and are not only, we're not only supportive of that outside proposition, but we are actively protective of it. And we think that you can be too, so I urge you to go outside proposition. Thank you. Thank you, and we have Emma, the second speaker for the opposition, please. of the refugee crisis instead of the propositions who aren't looking into future generations and the issues that they will be able to, that they will be forced to handle if we don't deal with this now. First, we must understand the social tensions in both the European Union and the United States. We need to let the general population become used to the refugees first instead of forcing them to accept the refugees at once. If we do let in a large influx of refugees at once, the citizens will react negatively to the changes changes and believe that their culture is being threatened. By letting in refugees exponentially rather than all at once, the general population can grow accustomed to the new population. Although tensions are very high in the European Union and the United States, it is important to understand that all refugees have a positive impact on culture in both the European Union and the United States. When refugees share ideas that may differ, um, may differ between cultures, Groups can reach a common conclusion and learn new things that they never knew before. For example, in the past, when cultures collided in the Arab world, groups learned more about medicinal practices. As said by Psychology Today on February 9, 2017, when our nation welcomes re refugees and immigrants and international visitors more generally, regardless of religion, race, or ethnicity, we reap important social and economic rewards, advance our country's commitment to human rights, and undermine efforts to radicalize both those outside of our borders and those within our borders. 
Overall, we understand that when refugees are admitted into a country, they have large positive impacts on society. But what the affirmation fails to accept is the social tension in the European Union and the United States. By letting in refugees at an exponential rate, we can ensure that the general populations of individual countries grow to become more accepting of others who have faced turmoil around the world. Thank you for that. And can we have the third speaker, please? Is it uh, Carolyn? Yes. Carolyn, yes, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my speech doesn't try to appear in your sense of morality, but it's based on an understanding of laws. We can spend hours talking about whatever is more incorrect or incorrect to welcome refugees and grant them with political asylum. As my fellow delegates said, there are many different views on the morality of the subject. But laws are laws, and we can't argue if we have to respect them or not, because we know that it's one of our fundamental duty to respect laws. The problem is when the government is the first that doesn't respect laws. I take Italy as an example, because it's the country that I know best since I live there. So, in Italy we have a right-wing government right now. This government is stopping many boats of refugees from arriving on the coast of Italy. In this way, the Italian government is not only preventing refugees to, enjoy, to have the possibility to enjoy a better life in Italy, but also in Europe as a well. whole. But as I said before, those are laws. And Italy, as well as the other countries, can send refugees back for four really easy reasons. The first is the UN Geneva Convention, ratified in 1951. In its article 33, uh, it states the principle of no refoulement, which asserts that a refugee should not be returned to a country where they face serious threats to, to their life or freedom. So every state that has ratified the Geneva Convention, in simple words, can send a refugee back home if the person is in line with the definition of a uh, refugee. The second region, uh, reason uh, change from state to state. Some states, in fact, dedicate an article of the Constitution to refugees. For example, the Italian Constitution states, a foreigner who in, who in his own country is denied the actual exercise of the democratic freedoms guaranteed by the Italian Constitution shall be entitled the right of asylum. Basically, also the uh, Italian Constitution say that every refugee has to have political asylum. The third principle is based on the Universal Decla Declaration of Human Rights, 1948. In its article 14, it states, everyone has the right to seek and enjoy asylum from persecution in other countries. And then the fourth principle is not as well known as the others, but it, it is really very important. The law of the Sea Convention that was created by the UN. It states the obligation to save people in difficulty in the sea and bring them to the nearest territory. If this does not happen, the state is breaking out article 1113 and 1158 of the sea law. If the ships bring the refugees cannot uh, enter the nearest territory, the state is breaking also uh, article 4 of the protocol number 4 of the Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedom, which states that the collective expulsion of aliens is prohibited. So, I want you to be aware of the fact that it is not only a matter of kindness, but also of legality. Clearly, laws, are, uh, ladies and gentlemen, are on our side, who represent legality, while the op opposition seems to ignore this fact. Ther therefore, support the proposition. Thank you. Okay, can we have Claudio, the third speaker for the opposition? Yes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In theory, the proposition has a good idea. However, in practice, their idea will not be sustainable for the economy of the EU. During the last 20 years, immigration became one of the most pressing problems of the world. We still don't have a solution to this problem, as some say accept refugees and some others refuse to let, uh, to let them enter. The EU wants to accept all refugees, but if it does so, it will likely collapse due to economic and political requirements. When we allow refugees to enter, we need to make sure that we can supply them with basic human necessities like food, housing, and jobs. The housing crisis 
in particular, is a major problem because their price is too high for refugees. For this reason, they prefer to live in refugee camps and they are overcrowded. And some diseases like Ebola can be spread all over Europe. Many of the countries that accept refugees don't fulfill these requirements, such as Italy, Greece, and Spain. Since the Italian presidential election, the refugee debate has become an oppressing theme. There has recently been some tension between France, Italy, and Spain regarding a vote of refugees. The EU is not as solid as before Brexit, and, and many independent movements want to use the refugee crisis as an excuse to go out of the EU, like the Netherlands. Their solution of accepting them all at once does not and will not work. The EU is in trouble. They are still dealing with the 2009 economic crisis, ISIS, and the Ukraine crisis, and now the deal is with the US. Accepting all refugee will create serious problems to the EU integrity, probably leading to the collapse. But this is set in the future. The EU cannot accept them all now. It cannot accept them, all of them now because of, of, its, of its economic situation. Greece almost failed in 2015, and Italy and Spain are not that far. Another problem is terrorism. Many of them come from Syria, Iraq, and Libya, states in which ISIS present is strong. The population of the EU is scared, but this is a problem. And also, independent movement uses this excuse to go out of the EU. The situation of the US is way different. According to the Telegraph, last year President Trump broke the New York Agreement on Refugees. This means that they will make their own refugee policies not taking seriously the problem. As we can see today, you has made a travel ban on seven states. As I said in my previous points, we will accept refugee, but proudly, as it's the best possible solution to this problem. We will accept refugees as the economy grows, and by doing this, we will guarantee the best possible life to refugees without compromising the economy of the EU. Thank you. Call upon Anastasia, the final and fourth speaker for the Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's debate. This House believes that all refugees should be granted asylum. I am Anastasia and I will be exploring with you today the economic benefits of welcoming refugees. Initially, new refugees are a draw on society as they seek to establish themselves in the new country where they are now safe. But after that process takes place, they contribute more in the long term than they receive upon arrival. This explains the focus, particularly in Canada, on achieving the swift integration of new refugees. The faster, the faster they can become integrated, the less government support they need upon arrival. I would now like to introduce to you a study that will prove my point. Study 1, the economic and social outcomes of refugees in the United States. This paper by William Evans and Daniel Fitzgerald found that, quote, over the first 20 years in the US, the average adult refugees pays taxes that exceed relocation costs and social benefits. The paper also concluded that the younger the refugee, the more likely they are to catch up upon their native-born peers in terms of education and economic success. Evans and Fitzgerald used data from 2010 to 2014 American Community Survey to create a sample of 20,000 refugees who entered the United States between 1990 and 2014. Refugee age between 18 and 45. I would now like to direct your attention to the board over there. The average relocation cost to state, 15,148. Average social benefit paid by the state, 92,217. And the average taxes paid by the refugee, 128,689. Not to mention that if they are integrated in the society with a job, they will most likely have a purchasing power that will positively contribute to the economic growth of that country. But let's leave that out for now. If we do the maths, and take the average taxes paid and subtract it by the average social benefit plus the average relocation cost. Therefore, 128,689 minus 107,365, we get 21,324. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, 21,324. So some people may say that it's too expensive to accept many refugees, but this evidence shows that in the long term, refugees are a positive contribution to a country's economy. Furthermore, some people may say that unemployment in their country will rise and that refugees are stealing their jobs. But that would just be extremely selfish and unconsidered to the fact that number one, it's a good enough reason to let people die in their own country and number two, it isn't even true. 
If they got the job, it's because they can do it better. Let's say they're in infrastructure and they help build a monumental building. This will therefore attract tourism and or foreign investment, which will therefore create new jobs. So we should nearly be thanking them for doing their job well. Moreover, in places such as the US and Greece, natives prefer to apply for welfare benefits rather than to take up low-paying jobs. Refugees don't have the same options open to them and therefore fill up excess demands in the low-paying skilled jobs. I'd like to bring up another example. We all know Germany, right? Well, in Germany they have free education, free university, free college, free schooling, which means that the refugees that enter Germany are very well educated. These very well educated refugees, whether in medicine, law or science, may very well choose to stay in Germany, which will once again positively affect the economy. And let's say they're not skilled workers. Germany will still have a larger workforce, therefore more people economically active paying taxes, which is one of their big problems in China currently. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now the end of my debate, and I urge you to vote for a team proposition, because we never know what life holds for us. For all we know, touch wood, tomorrow we are refugees as well. So what would you choose as a refugee? What's best for you and your family? Thank you. I call upon the final speaker for the opposition, Sam. Thank you. <laughs> Thus far in the debate, you have seen the emphasis that our case has placed on selecting a long-term plan rather than choosing a short-term solution when it comes to resolving one of the most dynamic and complicated issues of our modern-day society. When it comes to solving the refugee crisis today, it is critical that we find the most sustainable and realistic response to the refugee crisis. And when it comes to the economy, this is when we can distinguish why a long-term solution is far more beneficial than a short-term. In terms of the European Union, Brexit will pose one of the biggest threats to the European Union's economy and determine the fate of refugees. As seen in Politico on April 18th, 2018, quote, beyond the next few quarters, Risks are skewed to the downside. The IMS said it listed financial vulnerabilities and erosion of support for global economic integration, translation, rising protectionism and possible trade wars, and a host of non-economic risks, such as geopolitical strains, political discord, discord, and climate shocks. Judging by this evidence, the European Union has a future of uncertainty. So how can the European Union, with an unstable economic structure, welcome all refugees that apply for asylum and resettlement? Rather, gradually increase quotas with economic growth so that the European Union can ensure that their countries can grow to support the increased refugee population. Additionally, although refugees can support the economy in the long term, letting in all refugees now would cause massive economic uncertainty. Coupled with the current economic issues associated with Brexit, the short-term costs associated with refugees cannot be overlooked. Just last year alone, according to the OECD, the cost of processing and accommodating asylum seekers is estimated to be around 10,000 euros per application for the first year, but can be significantly higher if integration support is provided during the asylum phase. In the world of the proposition, accepting all refugees would greatly increase the cost for applications and for asylum, and they cannot promise that accepting all refugees would make a positive impact on the economy instantaneously. In fact, in Germany, one of the biggest acceptors of refugees, the German minister warns that most refugees are jobless for years, as 75% of refugees face long-term unemployment, according to the Sunday Express on June 22, 2017. Over time, as refugees gradually support the economy, then we can start allowing refugees to be admitted into the country at an exponential rate. When viewing the economy through the lens of the United States, the economy is far too unpredictable to welcome all refugees. Currently, President Trump's variable economic policies have led to unpredictability in the markets. According to the New York Times on May 31, 2018, the possibility of a trade war with China, Europe, and or Mexico and Canada is perhaps one of the biggest threats to the United States economy. From a realist, realistic perspective, it is critical that the United States treads carefully when it comes to increasing their quotas. In the United States, the government, government spends 15,900 US dollars per refugee. These mounting costs take a lot out of the US economy and the government's budget. Much like the situation in the European Union, it is critical that the United States treads carefully when it comes to admitting refugees, as there could be serious economic issues that arise as a result of Trump's erratic behavior. In the past, Western nations have often overlooked major issues by offering a minor solution. 
For example, instead of paying attention to the ethnic boundaries after World War I, Western nations simply drew boundaries with a ruler, causing some of the biggest issues in the Middle East today. Political instability, terrorism, and the refugee crisis that we are facing today. This is an opportunity for Western nations to rethink the crisis both logically and ethically, as which the affirmation is not doing. They are proposing an illogical fallacy, which will prove ineffective given the current economic situation of the European Union and the United States. By ensuring the future of the economy, we can make sure that all refugees of all cultures can come and prosper in the European Union and the United States. Right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm sure many graduates from leading Western University will be very proud of the speeches tonight. I mean, some of these students are not even in university. Um, obviously. Um, very, very brilliant. I think this, it shows, again, great skill. Uh, we'll give the teams a couple of, uh, maybe a minute or, so, uh, or two, just to gather questions which they want to use for rebuttals. And then after that, we will start our rebuttal session. So a couple, a couple of minutes, and then agree on two questions. Two, 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 two. the uh, proposition team and we'll ask them to direct their questions to the opposition and then after that a couple of questions will be asked by the opposition to the proposition side. Okay, so if we can start with the proposition team with your questions please. So, Sam? You can, you can stand here and do it here. Oh, I think it's easier for me. Alright, okay, that's fine. Yes, that's fine. My question today is discussing the radicalization of refugees. Um, given that 0 0.0000, that's four zeros, six percent of all refugees welcomed to the EU um, were arrested as suspected terrorists in the past 10 years, that's 20 people, ladies and gentlemen, um, only three of those sus um, suspected terrorists ended up actually having terrorist plots. How are refugees radicalized and doesn't introducing refugees into the Western world actually counter ISIS propaganda and go against what their message is? Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Uh, that's the first question. Uh, is that question directed at anyone? That is a general question. That's a general question. Okay, can we have question number two, please? Yes, go ahead. Um, so this is about the point from, uh, about social tensions. So you heard from immigrants and uh, I think other schools as well. Um, the idea was that like large influxes of refugees are going to cause social tensions. I don't think this is true for a few reasons. Firstly, we don't that we already have immigrants, we already have refugees, so we're not radically different from the status quo. Secondly, um, we think that this motion actually humanizes refugees um, and reduces tension. And thirdly, um, even if tensions exist, like we think that's a better uh, solution. We think that's better than the alternative, which is refugees in war zones, refugees dying. So we ask you, do you not think that? So do you really believe social tensions are so bad in countries? It's worth having refugees dying for. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So is that, is that also a general, general question, is it? 
for anyone to answer. Right, okay, so we have two questions. The first one on radicalization of refugees, and the second one on, on the social tension. On the social tension. Does it create tension? Yes. I would like to answer yes. this question. Social okay. tension. Oh, do I have to go up there? No, no. Okay, okay. Stay with me. Okay, so right now, let's look at the United States, for example. Tensions between refugees and like the general population are extremely high. I know, I'm from Texas. And so we understand the fact that like refugees aren't always welcome because a lot of people are brainwashed by journalism and like the media into thinking that all refugees are bad and terrorists. This like the proposition today, that it says nothing about changing the ideals or values of the general population. At least we're acknowledging the fact that these underlying tensions exist. And that's a major point to bring up. Because welcoming all refugees isn't humanizing them. This is only increasing the problem as you have, as the general population will see this as a bigger threat. And at least in our world, we're going to be exponentially, we're exponentially increasing refugees to the point that the general population can become more and more accustomed to the idea of having a new population around the country. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, and then the second question, I would like yep. to answer. Okay, um, you're right. Free uh, immigrant uh, refugees were sent back to their country, but we need to uh, understand that Italy sent uh, five five percent of 21,000 refugees back to their country because of socially uh, dangers, so terrorism because of this reason here, and uh, it's not they. We try to. Uh, return them in their country just to prevent a terrorist, a terrorist attack in our country. So we uh, prevent the attack and by sending them back, not to let them stay, let them have the attack and then uh, send them away. Okay, thank you for that. Right, so can we have two questions from the opposition team, please? Question number one, and can we have question number two? Uh, have any country of the EU have uh, anti-immigrant uh, laws? Sorry, could you repeat that? Have any? Uh, has any of the sorry, sorry. Not country, any country of the EU, EU. Some immigrant laws against immigrants? Are there any laws in, in place yeah. against immigrants? Like anti-immigration anti -immigration laws. laws in the EU. Yeah. Okay, fine. So, okay, you've got those two questions. So, the first question is directed to Emma. Um, I'm kind of glad you brought that up because we kept getting this vague idea from opposition about this alternative method that was better for all refugees. I was going to say the land law refugees without the issues that you brought up on your side of the house. But the um, the idea that I got from your first speaker was that um, you were planning to fix the root of the issue, planning to fix why there was refugee crises. And I sort of assumed that because it was war torn countries you were talking about, you were planning to sort of go in and try and sort that out. Which um, just because you didn't really explain that well, but that's what I'm too much, sorry, but I, that's what I assumed, and I feel that there's an issue with that, and that could um, create more issues with refugee crisis, but that's just what I get to in your cases. Okay, thank you for that, and the second question was in relation to anti-immigration laws. Um, I would like to answer Claudia's yes. question and to say that our debate is about refugees and not immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to have maybe just a couple more questions then. Yes, maybe two more questions each. It's obviously starting to get lively now. Um, so two more questions, please, uh, from the proposition team. So just give you a minute. Yes, a minute. Yeah, a minute. A minute. Two questions. Wow.
Right. right. Okay. So we're just going to try and make this brief. Right. Okay. So we have two questions from the proposition, please, to the opposition team. Um, this one is regarding the first speech wing, um, who proposed an alternative method to handling the influx of refugees. Um, one of the which we got was a form of military intervention. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you didn't know, the U.S. intervened militarily in Libya in 2011 and overthrew Gaddafi. This created a mortally dangerous and internationally um, complex problem and created a large influx of refugees. And this shows one of the ways that military intervention does not work as an alternate method to stop the root causes of refugees. This, therefore, military intervention cannot be applied, applied to areas such as Iraq and Syria. So we are wondering, what is your alternative method, and how will you implement this on the international level that every country will agree on? Thank you. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Question number one. And, and wait for it. Question number, yeah. or question number two, please. Yes. Okay. You said that you can um, accept all the refugees. But you have to accept them because of the international law. So are you ready to break at least three international laws? And because the, the UN Geneva Convention was ratified by quite all the countries. So um, how are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? Are you willing to break the law, the Geneva Conventions? OK. So two questions, very briefly, please. So the, the first question was directed at Wang. It was directed at Wang's point regarding an alternative solution to military intervention in in those spaces. Right, Wang, if you'd like to answer that. Um, yes, first of all, I would like to clarify that in my speech I said absolutely nothing about military intervention. And um, my alternative solution was to say that um, instead of blindly just accepting refugees whenever they needed asylum, and just taking in as many people as possible, even though that would be the morally correct solution, and my, my solution would be to um, accept most refugees um, using all the financial and uh, economical resources the country has to offer. And when a country reaches that limit, then they would, instead of taking in more refugees and filling up their limit, would, and instead the country would try to um, um, grow and try to develop more, um, earn more money, say increase their GDP, increase their output, then in the near future they would be able to grow and have enough financial resources to help um, take in more refugees and hopefully maybe even all refugees that will come towards your shores in the future and that would hopefully solve the issue in the long run rather than just um, trying to accept as many refugees as possible because this is um, this problem isn't just a small problem, um, it doesn't have simple answers, so we're just looking for a more significant, um, a larger uh, a, a solution with a higher impact and that lasts longer and longer. Okay, thank you. Okay, and then if we move on to the second question, which was about current uh, EU laws, uh, are, your, are you suggesting or uh, current international laws? UN laws. UN yeah. laws, yeah, UN conventional laws. Uh, convention laws. Uh, is there a, a reason to suppose that those laws might be broken or should be broken? Yep. Yes. Uh, we are going to break these laws, but in a good way. <laughs> because, uh, by following our policies, because like US broke, the, uh, broke these laws on the 3rd of December of 2017, but as I said before, it, they broke it in a wrong way by not accepting all refugees. We will do this in order to save our sovereignty. In order to save our so sovereignty. Okay, very good. Right, and now we're going to just move on to the last two questions, please, from the opposition team to be directed at the pro proposition. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Are there any anti refugees in <laughs> some country of the EU? Oh. Okay, are there any anti refugee? policies or laws currently in place. Um, okay, and the second question. So you reference morality a lot in your case, and I think we can all agree that's something we should focus on. However, when have states or countries ever regarded morality as the primary reason for doing anything? Right, very good. Okay. So, when has morality ever been used to do anything? Right, okay. So, who wants to answer the first question? Um, question? I have a, yes. Um, was it laws that are recognized by all countries in the EU or just specific countries in the EU? Uh, specific. Okay. Okay, I will answer that. Yes. Okay. 
Yes, there are countries that have laws that are anti-refugee in the EU. This is currently against international law, and these countries could be put in the ICJ, the International Court of Justice. If the UN decides to take action with it, which they have been discussing, they could be tried as criminals, international criminals. These laws are both against the 1951 Geneva Convention and remind us of the days where countries put a national identity before international sovereignty and making sure that everyone is included in our international community. Thank you. Okay, and then Oh, uh, very quickly, uh, just a comment. Uh, France has a public opinion against refugees, and uh, for this reason, there are laws against them. It's not because their leaders want, they don't want refugees. The public opinion convinced Macron to put these laws. Okay. Uh, 23rd of April 2018, Solidarity <laughs> Quattro. Okay, uh, then the second question was when is morality ever the reason to, to act? Um, morality is used as a recent act in many situations. I'm going to bring up World War II as an example. Um, in Germany, the, in Nazi Germany, Hitler was taking over territory. The West decided to not take any action because they didn't, did not feel that he was doing any damage to anyone in particular. But after the start of the Holocaust, they saw that it was their moral duty to take action. If we had not taken action at this point, what could have happened? It could have been, we could have been surrounded by fascism all around. Surprisingly, this is what's beginning in this our world with the rise of the Turkish government and potentially the rise of Trump. So I ask you all to um, ask about your morality and look back at the actions of the United States and the other Western powers in the last wars where they used their morality to step in and address the situations that were damaging the people and that are currently damaging our people today. Thank you. Maybe this will be picked up in the audience session. So, ladies and gentlemen, please, a round of applause. As you can imagine, this has been a very tense session, and it requires, again, knowledge of that particular, of those particular areas in which the dispute is occurring. Politics, uh, culture, economics, there's been a range of different subjects that are being tested here. Each student is being tested. So please appreciate that this has been very hard work for each of them, and they've done extremely well. Both sides have done extremely well. Right, we're going to take uh, maybe perhaps only a minute now to recover, and I will, uh, we will then proceed to the final part of this session, which will be uh, questions from the audience, okay? So if I can ask audience members to prepare their questions, I'll take a few in a batch, a couple of questions, and we'll put them to whichever team you wish to ask the questions. Yeah, we'll probably do them in batches of three. Yes, we'll do them in batches we'll of three. Two or three batches of three. Okay, so if I just get you to just, well, I'll just give you a minute, a minute to do that, please.
Right, we're going to now direct our attentions to the audience. We want you to think very carefully about and, and choose and select and identify questions which you think will really um, hit the mark here. Okay? You've, you've heard, obviously, um, and you've seen and witnessed the tensions between these two teams. Um, so we're going to take you in batches of, of three questions. Okay, three questions at a, at a time. And again, they can be directed to either the proposition team or the opposition side. So if I can... And, and all we need to be kind of concise. Yes, concise yeah, as possible, concise. okay, because there's a limit on time. So if I can ask um, you to raise your hands if you have a question, please. I'm just going to have a look first and see. Right, okay, we'll start over there on the right-hand side. If I could ask you to ask the first question, please. Yes. Okay. This is more directed towards uh, Sam's last argument. Sam's um, argument, okay, yes. yes. Sam's argument of morality not playing a part in, in... Action. Yes. Um, so, morality may not have always been used in governing, but why, why is that a good thing? Like, if you look at any, any historical case of imperialism, it obviously benefited the country that invaded. But we look at these things as historical atrocities. So why is this a good example to continue following? Okay, so in other words, if there has been immorality in the past, why should that continue? Why should immorality continue? I believe that's the question. Okay, so that will be the first question. Okay, the second question, please. And that question, by the way, is directed at the uh, opposition team. Uh, yes? So, Christine, yes. Um, if uh, there's a accepting the refugees, make more war or less war? Sorry, uh, repeat the question. Does, does accepting the refugees yes. make more war? Does it encourage more war or, or, or does it or lead to war? war? Because, for example, I want to invite the invader country. They don't feel guilty by the population because I think it's okay. Yes. Okay, so and is that for both teams? Yes, it's directed to both teams. So, does the acceptance of refugees potentially lead to wars? Or, or less wars? Or less wars? Yeah, does it lead to more or less wars? Okay, so that's the second question. The third, come on, third question, please, in this first batch. Yes? <laughs> so, I do um, agree that morality should be used as a way to make decisions sometimes, but I was wondering if you, uh, the proposition really believes that in World War II, um, the United States entered the war due to morality and believing what, what happened in the Holocaust was wrong, or due to the bombing of Pearl Harbor? Okay, yes. very good question. Yes. So, so was the Second World War <laughs> was the Second World War a result of the bombing of, of Pearl Harbor, or was it because of the uh, the actual morality of, of the whole of the whole of it? Okay, since morality is, I'm assuming it's not the real reason. Okay, so we're going to start with the answers, please. So the first question, just to remind ourselves, was. Is um, uh, why why is morality um, uh, even got, if even if decisions haven't been made in a moral way, um, why shouldn't they? Why should they? And why? why yes. Well, why should we stop uh, now in history and, and start to become moral, perhaps? Yeah. Okay. Or not? Sorry. Yeah. And not be moral. Sorry. Okay. So I completely acknowledge that morality should be a part of our everyday life. I think that's something we should always acknowledge. But the world is not moral because we've had events like the Holocaust and now we have the refugee crisis, right? And so I think, like I understand your question, right? But like, I think we need to be looking at this more from the perspective of if states are really acting in moral interest, then why haven't they already solved the refugee crisis? Why aren't they already taking in all refugees? And the fact that they need to be encouraged by morale, the fact that they haven't already been encouraged by morality is just showing that states really don't even care about morality, they just care about self-interest. And much like Tessa's question, the US did not go into the war because of the Holocaust. They came, went in because of the bombing of Pearl Harbor because they saw that as a, threat, as a threat to democracy. So states don't go in because of morality, they go in because of self-interest. And there's more historical examples. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and the second question, what was the second question? More, uh, to both sides. To both sides. sides. Well, um, One speaker each, please. More or less war. Okay. Um, so the question for more or less war, basically what we are saying is, if we do accept refugees, 
children from a young age will have lots of children from different cultures, different backgrounds in their classrooms. This will therefore mean that they will be a lot more understanding, empathetic, and respectful of different cultures, different religions, and different languages, which therefore means that perhaps in the long run, of course, we're just hoping we can't give any figures or whatever, but in the long run, we are hoping for less wars because people will be more respectful and understanding okay. and cooperative. Um, the five are still on. Well, they, they can oh, they can answer that, that question as well? Yes. Um, uh, a question. Do you mean um, <laughs> do you mean war in their native native uh, country or outside? Do you mean war in Syria, Iraq, and Libya, or in Europe? In Europe. Uh, in, in general. In general. Okay. Uh, since 2011, more than 25 million migrant uh, uh, refugees went to Europe. But war is still there, and ISIS in 2015 uh, was a great power, and I can see that today war did not end the future of refugee going to Europe. So I don't think that refugees will uh, diminish or um, make more war. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then the final question, a Texas question. Was um, uh, was about U uh, World War Two U.S. Did it enter? Pearl yes, Harbor, yes. Did uh, did did Pearl, Pearl Harbor or morality? Did the Western powers enter because of self-interest rather than morality? Who will answer that? Okay, go ahead. Um, I would actually agree to that statement that the United States did enter because of Pearl Harbor. That was a miss um, step by the United Kingdom. Sorry about that. Okay. But I would also like to add that the United States although it entered because of self-interest and they wanted to protect their nation and protect democracy, they were doing that because of morality. They wanted to protect democracy. They wanted to protect the idea of democracy. They wanted to protect the people. They saw the bombing of Pearl Harbor as a threat to the very things that they have built up to this point, to the very ideas of liberalism, the very ideas of democracy, the very ideas of freedom of religion, freedom of rights, that the, the things that the Axis powers were fighting against in World War II. They were killing off the Jewish people. They were hurt. Um, the Japanese had their own version of concentration camps where they were tortured millions. They were fighting for morality. It may have started as self-interest, but there was no reason that a war would go on for that long if it wasn't about protecting the people rather than self-interest. Thank you. Oh yeah, sorry, and there's one more uh, response from the, uh, from the opposition. I completely understand what you're saying when you say that like states enter in because of morality, right? But if you want to think about this further, the reason like the UK and the US like, invaded is because any attack on democracy is essentially a threat to the government, right? One's challenge to democracy essentially means that any part of democracy can be flawed. In order to protect the ideas of democracy, nations will often invade in order to ensure, hey, were the best power, right? That happened in the Cold War with the US and the USSR. Essentially competing ideologies. And when it comes to World War II, it was essentially the Axis versus the Allied, and in that sense, fascism versus the rest of the world. This war is simply contrasting ideologies and countries trying to prove that their idea of a government is better than the other one. It's not because they cared about people. They wouldn't spend resources on stuff that they cared about. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Okay, we're going to have another round of questions. Please think hard. Girls at the back, come on, people at the back, stop you know, using those brain cells for questions. Uh, I'm avoiding, deliberately avoiding over here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not easy. Um, okay, oh, um, okay, over here. Yeah. So. Okay, I'd like to pick up on Anastasia's speech. Um, when you talked about China, you said that the refugees could benefit the country as far as its economy was concerned. My question is, how would they do that? Okay, question number one, can you write that down? So it was about China's economy, and it's directed at Anastasia. Okay, uh, one more uh, question, yes, at the back. If the U.S. action of attacking... A bit louder, sorry. If the U.S. action of attacking the country was to that can be justified. Why can't the actual country not accept the refugee to protect their own people? Right, okay, I think I just with that. Um, <laughs> the justification, if, um, if America can attack a country to protect its own interests, yes, why can't a second country uh, 
the second part of it. This is why can't the second country country not accepting the not accepting refugees to protect their own people. to protect their own people be uh, justified yeah. be justified. Yeah. Did we get that one question? Yeah. Okay, okay. So that will be the second question. Okay, Bryce, go ahead. <laughs> okay, uh, so I think as Sam and I both know, being from Texas, a big problem with refugees coming in is people who have horrible intentions use these desperate people to their own personal uh, desires, such as drug cartels sneaking in drugs and illegally produced firearms into the country. Uh, I think Southern Texas is an area that accepts refugees, but it's still a huge, huge issue. So this is more towards the proposition. Okay, the uh, proposition. I'm agreeing with a lot of your points, but I'm not hearing a lot about kind of vetting procedures to make sure things like this doesn't happen. Okay, so basically the question I believe is about, are we vetting uh, refugees carefully so that they're not just people who are coming in with, with other intentions, bad intentions? Okay, is that three questions? I think it is, and I think they're all three is mostly directed at the proposition, actually. Right, okay, perhaps, I suppose, is that right? Okay, right, so if we can start then, please, with the first question, yeah. Anastasia. Um, so about China, for whoever doesn't know, China are known as economic champions, they're very successful in the economic world. Their GDP is now $11.2 trillion. Uh, however, one of their main problems is the Asian population, meaning that they don't have a lot of people that are economically active, paying taxes, and as well as that, the more they age, the more they cost to the government, uh, so such as health care costs would go up. Therefore, wouldn't, China, wouldn't a country like China, who are considered economic champions, benefit from refugees to have more economically active people, more people paying taxes and income taxes and stuff like that? Excellent. Yes. Okay. Very good. Okay. okay, and the second question was about if, if the US, if a country like the US can attack, why can't a country in its own self-interest, why can't a second country also be justified in, in opposing refugees? Is that right? Yeah. More or less. Okay, so I think that was at both though, or both sides, yes? So perhaps if the uh, opposition can um, say something about that? Uh, I agree with John. A country should be free to decide to uh, like allow the refugee to enter the country, but not don't let them enter, this is wrong. But let them enter in a, uh, gradually and uh, with controls. Because as I said before, they need food, housing and jobs. Okay, so there is some uh, process there. Okay, and the, uh, and the proposition, please. Um, <coughs> so this idea about like protecting your self-interest in like a time of war and protecting your self-interest when you have a refugee crisis, they're very different situations. And when you're protecting a country um, in a situation of war, like there's a difference between Nazis trying to take over the world and there's a difference between like refugees needing somewhere to live and living in a country that's torn apart. And I think that the threats that the two different groups pose are very different, and I don't think that's a fair comparison. And I would say that refugees um, are, are not, not a threat, but rather something that can um, contribute to a country in all the different ways that we've done, just saying. Okay, very good. And the last question is Bryce's question. Oh, yeah. Claudia, oh, Claudia wants to say something, all right. Um, in Turkey, Turkey is accepting refugees from Syria, although they are from a different type of Muslim religion. And this can create serious uh, public order problems because uh, Uzbekistan wants independence, and uh, there are parts of Uzbekistan also in Russia. Hey, sorry, Russia, Turkey, and and Turkey is all accepting refugees. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, sorry, we've got the. We've got the for Bryce's question. The uh, question. I'll take a few more. I'll take a few more. Bryce's question first. Yes. On um, I also live in a similar situation. I live in Southern California, about two hours from the border, so I see the effect of illegal immigration. There's a difference between illegal immigration and refugees. Let me remind you, in the 1951 UN Convention on the Status of Related Refugees, it says that a refugee is someone who is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin owing to a well-rounded fear. This refugee status is a vetted status. You cannot be viewed as a refugee until you've gone through the UN. Until you're viewed as a refugee by the UN, you're an illegal immigrant. The difference between immigrants, illegal immigrants and refugees, is that illegal immigrants are technically breaking the laws of immigration in the country, which um, all immigrants must follow. Refugees are allowed to break those laws because they have a fear of persecution. 
So the immigrants or refugees coming into um, the states currently right now are technically illegal immigrants because they have not been recognized by the United Nations as refugees, although I believe they, that, that they should be. However, the vetting process to become a refugee is very intense. And if they, uh, if when the UN goes into the United States and goes through the drug cartel refugees, they will be able to vet out the ones who are the bad apples or actually those who are trying to bring in their illegal weapons, or as Trump would call them, the bad hombres. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I think that um, we're nearly at the end. We're going to probably have, we have time for perhaps two more uh, questions, please, if you can think very hard about. Okay, we'll take the lady here at the front first. Oh, okay, okay, yes. And I know that Turkey welcomed 3 million Syrian in one year, but those people should enter in this country or they will die. And the war is not because of Syrian people, it's beside, between Turkish people and Kurdish people. So yes. just don't confuse two. Please don't confuse the issues, Claudio, oh, yes, please. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so that was just a comment, that wasn't a question. Two okay, so two, two questions. So, come on. Um, okay, gentlemen over here. Is the advancement in the world? A bit louder, sorry. Is the advancement in the world will be great or bad for the refugee crisis issue? For the refugee, so again, repeat the question. Is the technology advancement will be positive or negative? Ah, very good question. Will, will a technological advancement actually help the refugee crisis, or will it be harmful for the refugee crisis? Technological advancement. Okay. Yeah, let me have My question to this is that firstly, I'm, I'm Chinese, so yeah. when you talk about like um, China has a very huge um, GDP, but in fact, I'm sure it's not so. In fact, the GDP per capita in China is very low. So when refugees come from, come to China, it will make it even worse. And uh, talking about the, uh, my question to this side is talking about economics. Like you said, that um, in the long term, so refugee it, it's become very competitive because they take take the citizens' job. So it only takes a long time for it to work, like improve economic, like improve economics. But in the short term, like obviously. Obviously, for every government, they they regard their, like they put their citizen in the first place. So, in the short term, how do you like solve the problem? Like this, this refugee, like the citizens in the country suffering from the refugee, like they lose job and they. Okay, so so basically, what I, from my un I understand is that the refugee, the, the arrival of refugees, is a direct economic threat to the jobs. Of, of people in China, okay, using China as our example. Okay. Can I suggest you answer that one first, yes. and then answer the yes. technological one, which is both sides. Both sides, and that's, and that's probably okay. both short and sharp answer. Okay, so the question, the first question is about um, uh, the direct impact of, of refugees on the jobs in China. Not is that correct? Not yeah. Only yeah. In China, Sorry. Not only in China. Not only in China, but for any country that accepts refugees. Okay, Anastasia. So let me make it clear that we didn't say that it was going to be easy. But we are talking about human lives. Now, I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes and imagine of leaving your parents and family because number one, it's really cringy, and number two, it's even really horrible to even imagine because it's such a terrible thing. We're talking about human lives here, and I think that's something maybe we didn't talk about too much, but it's human lives. It's mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, sons, kids. It's, it's so much more important than just a job that you might lose. You, jobs will be created. The economy will move on, the economy moves on. There's always a peak, always a trough. First thing you learn in an economics class. But the most important things, we're talking about human lives now. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Great, okay, and then the second question was? Technological advancement. Technological, this is directed at both. So maybe we can start with, uh, start with the opposition, please. And then final. And then the final, yeah. To answer your question, I believe that technology will deeply work, like will worsen the refugee crisis we're seeing today. And I believe, like first, looking at Bashar al-Assad and his regime in Syria, right? The use of chemical warfare in that region has practically devastated the population. 
but and yeah, technol technology is a huge factor in this. But what I think we need to acknowledge here is that on our case, we are offering a direct and long-term solution to this, keeping in mind both the sustainability of the EU and the US, as well as keeping in mind the lives of refugees. Because as I want to stress, it is important, like every single life is important, and what the affirmation is saying isn't really solving anything. They're just spouting facts about saving lives, and in reality, they aren't even giving any justification for it. So we all actually offer the best solution in this case, especially when it comes to Syria. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this will be the final, this will be the final response for tonight. Okay, and if we could just get, make it very brief, and then we're going to take the vote, okay? So, final response for this evening, please. Um, I agree that Bashar al-Assad's use of chemical weapons will deeply worsen the refugee crisis and will increase the amount of refugees. I actually would like to applaud Trump on his use of bombing on the chemical weapons because he's, he actually did save lives that day. But I would also talk about the um, technological advancements that will happen. Currently, right now, asylum applications are done on paper. Because of the technological advancements made in the 21st century, applications can happen electronically, which has helped decrease the um, application wait, asylum application wait time from 10 years to only two years at this point. And with the technological advancements happening every single day, perhaps we can decrease this time so that we, we can save more, more, more people every single day. I would also like to point out with the technological advancements, we will be able to have renewable energy and different types of food resources. This will help fix the problem as um, I believe it was Wang who mentioned, or I'm sorry, Claudia who mentioned the food and resources depleting because of refugees. With technological advancements, we will have more energy and more resources to pull into the refugee crisis. Thank you. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of the session today, okay? Uh, we're going to give both teams a few minutes to recover. Maybe we can ask them to leave. Yeah, I think that's true. That's what we're going to do. Actually, I'll be back. back. Oh, okay. So maybe, maybe if the two teams can head towards, towards the door. Okay. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take the vote, okay? So it's a show of hands. And you have three possibilities. Either you agree with the motion, okay, you agree with the proposition, or you disagree with the proposition. So I'm going to take, I'm going to ask you three times. Or the third one is you wish to abstain, which means you don't wish to vote either way. So I will take an abstention as well. Okay? So if you're not decided, you haven't really decided, or you don't want to give marks to any side, then you put up your hand if you wish to abstain. Abstain. Okay, so I'm going to take the first one, which is for the proposition. How many people believe that the proposition team over here won tonight's debate? Show of hands, please. Uh, how many hands, show of hands, please, for, the, the, who, uh, for those who believe that the proposition uh, won tonight's debate. Oh, oh, sorry, opposition. Opposition. opposition won tonight's debate. One. Okay. Just one. Okay. <laughs> and can I have a show of hands for abstentions?
sort of nerve-wracking part of the of the evening because I have to select one individual uh, for me personally that is nerve-wracking um, individual and difficult 
uh, decision. So I have to decide on what I think is overall the best uh, sort of speaking and debating performance. And I must confess uh, uh, again, with, with, uh, and I've expressed it to, to, to Frank as well, that it's been very difficult to choose one individual because I believe uh, there have been some truly outstanding speeches tonight and very good performances on both sides. Commended, uh, well, you know, uh, I commend both sides on a, ver a very good work. Um, so, um, it was very tight, I must say. It was very tight. It was down to like two individuals in the end. But I think for her brilliance, overall brilliance, uh, confidence, <laughs> <laughs> That's already cancelled out, the, the guys. Um, for, her, for her overall confidence and I suppose the um, initiative that she's shown on, on in answering questions immediately and, and um, being in a, in, a, in a sense improvising very well, uh, the, the award tonight goes to Anastasia. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have a result for tonight's event. We have a result. And um, it's not the first time, but it is rare uh, to get a landslide, more or less a landslide, okay? And it has been more or less a landslide result tonight, okay? So, um, we'll start with the abstentions. We had seven abstentions tonight. Seven. So seven individuals felt that they could not make a absolute decision on the performance tonight. So I thank you for that vote. And with two votes, with two votes, um, we have to announce, I have to announce that, to announce that the opposition would, uh, had, had two votes tonight. So I'm sorry to say that you are not the winners for tonight's event, but with an outstanding landslide win, it is 21 votes for the proposition. <laughs> however, however, the proposition's arguments were noted by the three of us, by the three speakers tonight, and we think you've done a very, very good job. But well done to the proposition side. We agree. We think uh, it's, a it's been a very difficult debate, a very uh, awkward de debate. It requires a lot of uh, a lot of skill. It's not been easy, but I think you uh, deserve tonight's prize. So, ladies and gentlemen, a final round of applause, please. <laughs>